Okay, my guest today on the show is Mason Musso. Uh, you may know him from the band Metro Station, among other projects. Mason, thank you so much for joining me on the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you for having me, Lewis. <clears throat> so I want to start off right at the beginning. Um, something that's really interesting to me are families that have seen success in, in multiple kids. I know you're from a family yourself. You've seen crazy success. Um, your brother, uh, Mitchell, seen success in his own career. What do you think it was about your family, your upbringing, that created children who were not only talented, but, but had in them to, to pursue their goals, to pursue their interests right the way to the top? Gosh, uh, it was a, it, we had a very good family structure. I mean, my, my parents both were in theater, uh, so they all, that's how they met. And so they did, you know, plays, um, but just around the Dallas area, I mean, nothing, you know, that's where I grew up was in Dallas, Texas. Um, it's nothing big. And, and so, you know, they were always open to, um, us being creative, you know? So I think that helped a lot. Um, uh, yeah, they just, they let us, they let us be creative. You know, they, when I was young, they bought me my first guitar and, you know, I wanted to do music and they were stoked about that, you know, and with Mitchell, he, he, he loved doing acting and my littlest brother, Mark too, did some acting as well. So yeah, I think they just let us be ourselves, you know, which is really important. For sure. So what was it about, you know, you, you said you had music, Mitchell mm -hmm. obviously had acting. What was it about music specifically that set your soul on fire from a young age? Uh, I learned how to play in the church. I learned how, uh, growing up in Texas, you know, I was, I was in one of those giant mega church, Texas mega churches with, you know, a skate park and a, and a, uh, you know, a arcade room and, uh, you know, thousands of people attending Sunday service. And then on Wednesdays, they'd have the youth service at, at the, uh, you know, where the skate park was at this uh, place called Pier 419. The church I grew up going to is uh, Lake Point. I owe a lot of, uh, I owe a lot of, you know, who I am and, you know, learning to play music by being at that, that church. Um, so yeah, Wednesday nights was youth night and I was, you know, in the youth band, you know, from like 12, 13. Um, and that's how I learned how to play, you know? So. so what were some of your early influences? I know a lot of kids, maybe around my age, I'm 25 now, grew up. I mean, when I was younger, I remember that we had a TV station called Kerrang! And oh, just played course. music videos. And I remember there was a there was a time where whenever you put Kerrang! on, you could always guarantee you'd see Shake It by Metro Station on there at some point in the day. So yeah. so many kids that would have been influenced by by you. But who are some of your early influences in music? A lot of a lot of guys from from your neck of the woods, uh, Depeche Mode, OMD, New Order, The Cure, uh, a lot a lot of a lot of Brits, really. I mean, uh, uh, and then as far as you know the you know the American side goes, um, uh, from an early age, I was in love with the Beach Boys. Uh, you know, it's. It, highly controversial but i'm much more of a, a beach boys guy than a beatles guy i'm sorry to say but that's just how i feel you know so but yeah a lot of a lot of british a lot of you know british stuff um in, you know bands from england um uh very influential on me and um I, you know also in school it was you know it was the normal you know blink 182 uh was big you know but but uh it was always it was a little too punk for me i think i don't know uh, the cars i love the cars growing up um a lot of bands that i was you know i wasn't around you know i, I was born in 89 so i had missed that whole you know i'd missed all the 80s but i seem to have you know fall in love with a lot of 80s stuff you know yeah yeah so a lot of people take up music they love music they just learn yeah. for the fun of it but at what point did you start taking it that that step further when did you start writing your own music writing your own songs when did that come around right right when i grabbed the guitar hmm. you know learned a couple chords learned how to play some power chords and i would you know immediately i was you know um 
you know, that was, that was, you know, it, especially going up in that, you know, in that kind of like uh, church environment, you know, the church environment, you know, everyone's, you know, hanging out with your friends and everyone's kind of got a guitar. Everyone, you know, wants to sing worship songs and they want to sing their own songs. And um, I don't know, everyone, it's a lot of people I went to school with. I mean, it was, you know, it was, you know, definitely, you know, football was super popular, but, you know, being able to play guitar, you know, I mean, that was, that was cool too, you know. Do you remember your first, I mean, I remember my first guitar was a really beaten up Fender Squire. Do you remember your first guitar? Uh, it, it was one of those like package deal, uh, an Ibanez yeah. with like an amp and a guitar and <laughs> one of those. Amazing. So you mentioned there about, you know, growing up being the kid that loves music. What was school like for you? Um, you know, you mentioned maybe you weren't one of the kids who were, you know, one of the jock kids who went to sport. Maybe you were one of the, I don't know, maybe one of the outsiders. What was it like? Yeah, I, I was friends. I, I had a lot of different. I had a lot of different friends, but um, yeah, I definitely sat at the uh, the weird kids' lunch table for sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, but um, you know, also being involved, you know, with the church and stuff, you know, that you know, I, I, I knew I knew a, a lot of different people. Um, what was it like? It was good. I mean, it was definitely. You know, if you're not doing sports in Texas, uh, you know, that's not, you know, I tried, I try to do sports. I mean, I, I, but I was just, I'm not really a sports guy, you know, mm -hmm. sadly. So I mentioned they right at the top uh, Metro station. So let's fast yeah. forward a couple of years. How, when, t talk, uh, talk to us about the time that Metro station formed. How did it come about? When are we talking? I was 16, 32 now, so, you know, <laughs> half my life ago. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I met, I met Trace and we started a band. I mean, it was, you know, for us, we were super influenced by a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, MySpace was everything um, back then. Sorry, I keep getting pinged. No problem. Um, MySpace was everything back then. And so we started a band, put it up on MySpace and, you know, got on the unsigned artist charts. And, um, sorry, just let me tell people to stop texting me real quick. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, we got on the unsigned artist charts, and that's when, you know, people started hitting us up, like Columbia Records, Capitol Records. Um, I think we got to number four, I want to say, or something like that, um, which, you know, MySpace was amazing. I mean, it was literally a Spotify, a Twitter, and Instagram all rolled into one, and I don't know what, I don't know what happened with that. I, I, I'm not sure how that, you know, it, it, it kind of, to me, it feels like it got broken up, and then each of these big companies took a little piece of what MySpace actually was the way I kind of see it. Um, but MySpace was, I mean, it was, it was so, it was, it was great. You know, anybody could get online and post their music, their pictures, you know, what they were thinking about, you know, whatever. And then we got signed to Columbia. Um, the day I turned 18, pretty much I signed, you know, I signed the record deal. I couldn't, they, I wasn't going to sign before I was 18. They didn't really want us to anyway. Um, and then, you know, we started touring. You know, got in a van and started going across the country. So, so, and it really wasn't until Kelsey was pushed first, and and Control was pushed, and Control was even pushed to Alternative Radio, but they hated it. They didn't, you know, I think Alternative Radio back then really didn't like Control uh, for whatever reason. I don't know, but it wasn't until Shake it got. Um, it got like song of the week on iTunes or something like that. And that's when it, and that's when shake it kind of blew up. So. Yeah, it certainly did. So what lessons did you learn then from, you mentioned being in the industry from such a young age. I mean, I imagine you're going in with maybe this naivety, maybe this sense of wonder, all the glitz and glam. Um, you didn't know exactly what the industry was going to be like. What lessons did you quickly learn after entering? Lots. <clears throat> 
um, you know, my, my first manager always said, you know, uh, ego drugs and relationships really, uh, can kind of met, can kind of mess with everything, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing in it. You're, you're in a business, you know, where for me, I feel, you know, you're selling emotion, right. You know, and it gets tricky. Um, especially, you know, once I, especially for me, you know, if I, if I really feel a song, you know, and I'm emotional about a song and then I have to go, uh, play that song over and over and over and over again, it kind of, it loses what it was to me in the first place, but it's not about me, but it just, it's, it's kind of one of those, you can get jaded very fast, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially if you have lots of success very quick and it's, it's, you know, especially at 18, you got a bunch of money and you can do whatever you want and you can, um, everyone's offering you all kinds of things, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to lose your way yeah. for sure, you know. Took me a long time. Took me a long time to learn that. So, well, I wonder a lot of young kids in that industry who've you know they they don't know all this is new to them, all this opportunity. How yeah. easy do you think it is for you know the passion, the reason you got in your style? How easy is that to be to become manipulated or changed or other people get you know changing that just because here's this opportunity. If you tweak this year, maybe there's a little bit more money, a bit more incentive. How easy is it to go down that road? It's easy. I mean, I, I don't hate it on anybody for wanting to, you know, make money. I mean, I sure, just, sure. Uh, you know, hey, you know, do what you got to do. I would encourage everyone, you know, if you're if you're doing, you know, I think today you can do it independent as long as possible. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to say no when there's an offer on the table and it can change your life. So, you know, um. And you, and, you know, just like anything else, I mean, you're going to have to, you know, once you do sign a deal, you're going to have to relinquish some creative control, which isn't always a bad thing. A lot of, a lot of different people have great ideas that can help you, um, you know, I mean, one of the, you know, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's easy, very easy, especially today, I think, you know, um, in, you know, secular modernity i think you know a lot of people don't have any sort of grounding at all you know luckily i was i you know was in, forced and you know at a young age i you know my parents made me go to church and um you know it def it gives you grounding man you know you definitely lose your way you know uh but you you know from what i've experienced you know a lot of a lot of people i grew up with you know we always a lot of them come home. It's like, you know, um, uh, it's like, uh, the hero's journey. Um, I forget who, who, do you know what I'm talking about? The book, the hero's journey. I forget the, the, I writer. can't give you the author off the top of my head. No, <laughs> I'll tell you right. I'll tell you right now. Let's look it up. The hero's journey. Um, Joseph Campbell. Oh Yeah. Who is super influenced by like Hume and uh, and um, you know uh, just you know that that story is, is you know even though it's you know uh, it's real you know it's real you know I hated I I wanted to leave home at an early age and get away from that you know kind of lifestyle and then as I don't know as you grow up you see the world you know just like the Hobbit you know you you want to go you know you know part of me uh, um, yeah. I wanted to come, I wanted to come back home. I realized how important home is, you know, and how important, you know, those values I was taught at an early age are, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, you hear the stories in the industry of all the, you know, the parties, the drink, the drugs. How did you manage to, to navigate your way through all that stuff and stop yourself from going down the road that maybe so many at a young age have gone down? Is it religion? Is it those things you were just talking about? Well, I don't, I'm not, for, I want to make sure I'm not hating on having a good time. For sure. You know, don't want to, I'm not hating on that. That's fine. But if it becomes more important than the music, you know, if it becomes, you know, it's hard when you're on, when you're on the road and you're away from home and you miss, you know, if you have people you miss and, um, 
you know, uh, you know, especially when you're on the road, I mean, there's no better feeling leaving home and there's no better feeling coming back home is kind of how, it's kind of how I, I see it. You know, it's the, it's the classic, the grass is always greener. I mean, you want to, you want to leave and then you want to come back and, um, but you know, if, if you're just trying to, you know, if you don't appreciate it for what it is anymore and you're just trying to get off stage so you can go get drunk, you know, or, or do drugs, if that's, you know, kind of what, what's in the back of your mind, then, you know, it, you'll self-destruct very fast, you know, and it happens to a lot of people. I mean, it's the, I mean, it's just the, not only musicians, but actors as well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's just, it's, it's a classic story, you know. So you're a young adult. And you, like you said, you're in the van, you're touring. These are formative years in, you know, a young person's life, 18, 19, 20. Those are the years, you know, your friends, they're growing up. You're starting to find out who you are, but, you know, you're on the road. You've got all this, this new world in front of you. Was there a, could you talk about a little bit of the price you have to pay for these type of opportunities, the things you missed out on, maybe the, the, the things that everyone else, uh friends in your hometown were, were getting to experience that you didn't get to experience you had to sacrifice to make this dream work man i really i don't want to say i had to say i got i was so blessed to to be able to do that but i but i will say you know like for instance uh you know you i my I had my grandfather, you know, pass away like a year ago or whatever. And I, and you think about stuff like that. You're like, man, I, I wish I would have had more time to spend with them, you know, but I was touring a lot, but you know, it's good because I was making money and I was able to, you know, support, you know, so stuff like that. You miss a lot of, um, you miss a lot of that, you, you know, especially when, you know, as I get older, you know, more and more and more people you love start, you know, even friends of mine. I mean, I've had friends who've OD'd and died and stuff like that, you know, so you think about that, you know, man, would have been nice to spend more time with them. And when you go back home, you see how much your home has changed and you're like, you know, you know, you can, you, yeah, you can go back home, but it's never the same. Right. You know, sadly. Is it hard to know in those times who to bring into your inner circle who to For trust sure. among your friends who's a real friend who's got motives who's got agendas how do you sure. navigate something that complex well luckily time does that uh sadly you get burned a lot in the process but uh yeah i had i mean it, you know again you know i with you know a lot of my friends you know i've had a lot of great friends but then there's some people that you know have you know, they kind of just, they're around and like, you know, especially with me, you know, if I'm paying for everything and I'm, you know, um, you know, my circle is, you know, uh, especially back in the day, you know, I was taking care of a lot of different people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to find out who's, who's, you know, your real close friend and who's going to be, you know, you know, when the chips are down, I'm going to be beside you. I mean, but I think that's with everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah. As you, especially as you get older, your you, my my circle of friends has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and uh, it's it's a good thing. I have lots of acquaintances. I have lots of like you know. I would I would consider Lewis yourself a now we are acquaintances. Right. Now we're you know friends, whatever. But you know that's but you know as you get older, your your circle of really really close friends you super you know you trust get smaller yeah sure and yeah what well, in terms of people out there now thinking yeah maybe i do need a smaller um inner circle but you know i think a lot of people feel a bit ruthless in terms of cutting people oh, yeah. out because they think yeah. ah but we invested so much time i knew that person from like when i was five years old so they feel guilty do you have to be a little bit selfish Yeah, but I, you know, you should try, you should try to, you should try to, you know, not be, mm. but 
you know, if so, if you feel like someone's wasting your, you know, more so than ever as I've, as I've gotten older, it's like, you know, um, if especially someone who's constantly has problems and stuff you know and is constantly you know if if we keep having the same conversation where you know you're going through something or you know and you're not giving me any any sense of like oh these are some steps i'm going to take to to better my situation or you know something like that it's like you know i you know you can't be a babysitter for people um you know uh but yeah i mean there's a sense you you know that you know you got to kind of be a little ruthless sadly um especially in the entertainment industry i mean again it's selling you know emotion and you know with acting it's you know you're you know paid to be a really good liar really you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but you know yeah the people who are the you know especially here i mean i live in um i'm in uh, santa monica but you know the hollywood area but um it's it's brutal hollywood you know, LA is like, and I've said, I've, I've said this before, it's, it's like Las Vegas. So Las Vegas would not exist if hundreds of millions of people didn't lose money every single day, hmm. right? It wouldn't be there if people were winning. And LA is the exact same way. It is the city of dreams. no. Not really. It's a city of broken dreams, you know, for each star that's on that walk of fame, whatever, millions, hundreds of thousands that have failed and tried. And, and it's, and it's sad. It's, 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 you know, yeah. the lights and the shows and the cameras and the act, you know, all that. And it's like, you know, it's, it's a big party, but you know, it's a, it's a, this, you know, it's got a, um, it's got a ruthless cut, you know, sunny place for shady people kind of vibe you know i love it but it is it is ruthless you know and i and yeah as you get older you you realize more and more of the world's like that um you know love is important too you gotta you know you gotta absolutely you gotta you know but that's why you know within my tight circle of friends you know i can show a lot of love to them and then um you know be kind whenever you can but yeah they'll they'll you know there's uh you know, there's people that don't, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous world. I don't know what, the, <laughs> what are you, you know, what yeah, are you going to do? You know? So, yeah, it's interesting. Like when I first, well, I first tried to start this podcast when I was in university and I had friends at the time who I'd known for, for a long time, we were close, but I tried to start this podcast. I made a video and I woke up the next morning and my friends found it and they were sort of ripping on me, ridiculing me. So I hid it away. I didn't start this podcast then for another two years. And I remember at the time thinking, yeah, I've invested a lot of time in these people. You know, I like these people, but what are we doing for each other really? We're not, you know, we're not helping each yeah. other grow. We're only holding, each other. so I don't really need to them in my inner circle. Like I'll always, you know, there'll always be a place in my heart from, but maybe just not at my table, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like you you touched a nerve, you know, like a, um, you know, like a union shadow, you know, they, the, you know, it, they were hating on you because they're like, wow, you know, Lewis is actually doing something. I need to hate on that because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not doing, you know, I, I don't know. That sounds, yeah, those are definitely not your friends if they hated on you for, you know, you wanting to start something and create something, you know, that sounds like their, their shadow came out and, and attacked you, you know, because they were jealous, hmm. you know, sure. two years you waited. That's sad. Yeah. I mean, I think to myself sometimes, don't talk to those people ever again. Don't ever <laughs> talk to those people ever again. I know. And you think, I think, <laughs> where could I be now if I started two years before I did? So it's always in the back of my mind. So, we talked about this monster hit, Shake It. Now, I spoke to a uh, a musician from my side of the pond. He was big in the 90s. His name was Chesney Hawks. He had a song called The One and Only. It was a massive hit. It was pretty much everywhere when my parents were younger. It was the top song. And after that, he, he got caught up in the, the fame, the glitz, the glamour. And he thought it was always going to be that feeling. He was always going to be riding that wave of being the biggest in the country. And when that stopped being the case... He had 
big struggles with that. He didn't know who he was anymore. He didn't ever think that was going to come. He always thought he'd be riding that high. Yeah. Is that something you've ever experienced? Because you sh- that song was everywhere. For- and it does resurface a lot. But was... Mm. On TikTok, that- it has been, uh, especially. For sure, yeah. I wanted to get into that. Um, but yeah, is, is that ever something you've dealt with? The highs and the lows? It definitely, uh, absolutely, you know. Um, but... I mean, I think that happens to to everybody. I think, you know, even, um, you know, someone like, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, a lot of artists, you know, there's been a bunch of them who die young and then they, you know, become, you know, legends and stuff like that. And I think, you know, as, as you get older, it's just, you know, you can't stay on, you know, top forever. Um, you know, uh, but you know that I never, I, I never did it to, to you know. I got lucky with that. I, I just, I love music, you know. But it can definitely, it can definitely, you know, affect you um, if you let it. Well, you mentioned there the TikTok. I mean, this song. I feel like, yeah, ever since yeah. I was a kid, it does resurface every every now and again. It's a it new does. wave of people interested. And in, yeah, you said lately TikTok. There was a trend. It was a trend. What is it about this song, do you think? Why does it keep resurfacing like it does? My, my theory is, is it's, it's uh, like, so in the, in the chorus, it's like, now if she does it like this, will you do it like that? So I'm talking from a third person perspective, hmm. um, you know, telling the, telling, talking about, you know, this story going on. Um between two other people and I don't know I don't to me I just think that that's an, a weird part of it and I think you know it just lends itself to you know kind of a dance it has this dance thing and you know all these TikTok different things where people you know do a dance they just create a dance to it it's just that happened in the very beginning too kids were putting on YouTube them doing dances to the song so it just I don't know what it just clicks something just clicks with that mm. and people create dances to it you know yeah tiktok is is a strange but how like i feel like i keep hearing songs that are tiktok trends and suddenly they're having two months stints on the radio and they haven't been played since the 80s and now they're massive in the charts again do you think tiktok has a massive influence on the yeah. industry now 100 percent. Mm. i i know i know for a fact uh that uh, there are labels flying out TikTok people to do dances mm. for new releases that these labels are putting out from artists to kind of make it seem organic, mm. which is smart. For sure. Hey, that's a hey, good, you know, super smart guys. But, uh, you know, TikTok is, is, potentially even more important than radio i mean to get us to get a song going you know to catch fire like that um say yeah you know labels labels know i mean you know if you're a smart savvy business person you know this you get someone who's who's very good at doing the dances and making you know and you're like hey we're gonna fly you out put you up in a nice hotel we'd like to you know take you out to dinner and you know uh who know you know what else you know hang out uh throw you some money i don't know um but we got this new artist we'd love for you to create a dance for it and you know put it up on your tiktok that'd be awesome yeah i mean these people you know these it's a very you know these are business people you know i remember thinking that um because there was a, a couple of months ago there's a, there a song an old song by boney m called rasputin and it became a tiktok trend yeah and and everyone started all the, I remember walking down the street once and this kid had a, a speaker and he was playing out of a speaker and I thought, you wouldn't play that if it wasn't for TikTok at your age. And I just remember thinking, how easy would it be for a record label to, yeah, reach out to one of these top TikTok stars and say, well, you know, we could pay you this if you start a little challenge and then all of a sudden there's so much more return on that investment. They, they are doing that. Wow. It's crazy. They are doing that. By the way, I, uh, I love uh, that song. 
And um, I'm a big fan of like Russian history and I love, uh, and uh, I just listened to this podcast from, um, uh, do you know uh, uh, Tom Holland? He does the yeah. the rest is history podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did one, they did one on Rasputin. It was very okay. good. Um, there's that new movie actually coming out, The King's Man. Uh, and it's all, and the villain is Rasputin. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it looks really good. I, I, uh, I, like I said, I love, I love uh, super into that Rus Russian history, especially, you know, that, um, that uh you know right before world war one you know mm. so you mentioned history there outside of music what do you love what are your passions what do you love to do in that in that time away from the guitar i love his uh, it's the only subject i did well in really mm. um i love history i love um uh you know i'm super into you know people like you know uh jonathan paggio mm. who uh you said you've you've had on yeah so uh history religion politics psychology um uh yeah i like i like all it. I, I, at philosophy <clears throat> you know uh there's i like i like i like a lot of that stuff amazing so let's get on to on back on that record label where do you stand yeah. on the the record label versus independent debate that we see well more prominently in the last year or two i mean this yeah. you see stories all the time of someone saying a record label offered me this much i went my own way i made this much uh, if they offer you a good deal i can't hate on it yeah for sure if it's enough money to change your life you know go for it mm. um you know the big you know the big the big labels are you know they know they know what they're doing they're super smart um if you can do it independently do it for as long as you possibly can hmm. um you know so what i remember so this. sorry i keep getting these pings i'm sorry no about problem. that i've told I, I literally texted everybody don't hit me up <laughs> it's all good brother all right. um yeah i remember listening so, yeah before. i would say i would say labels you know, I can't hate on it. Yeah. Definitely changed my life. Hmm. But if you can do it as do it independently as long as possible. Yeah. Yes, because for someone like myself, just fans of the industry, not being in it, you know, we think big record label, big yeah. deal, you're set for life. But I remember listening to an interview with one of my favorite bands called Alter Bridge from America. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that they practically at this point, they really don't make their money mm -hmm. from the records anymore the money comes from touring the record is yeah. that is, is that the case because i mean for a fan you just think big record deal you're minted you you know you're fine but is that not the case no merch is definitely important and touring is definitely important um mm -hmm. if you if you know a song sticks i mean it just it makes you know it does and it does well then it can be very lucrative but yeah touring is super important you know mm -hmm. playing shows is very very important yeah so one thing I heard you speak on before that I found really interesting, I can't remember the channel of the interview it was, but it was on the topic of punk and you were talking about how punk has changed and how originally it was all about fighting the man. It was about going against the system, going against the machine. And you said, it and, you, and I started to reflect and I think of the punk bands of today and yeah, all of a sudden it is socialist. It is group think it's, you, was there a point, you recall in which they made that switch or was that a gradual thing that we just sort of crept up on us without us noticing i think that was with joshua phillips uh of epoch times that's right yeah and um uh, great guy very very smart uh when was the flip it, it's i don't know i'm not sure yeah because i remember it def yeah you had uh the sex pistols guys like this yeah they're really one way and then you look today and uh johnny rotten from the sex pistols people hate on that guy now all these punk fans yeah he was never he, he lives was, out here he lives he lives right up he lives right over here in venice on the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's crazy how we've got away from that style of punk now punk is something that's com that completely it's a completely different thing now Yeah, you you can't 
have all of the mainstream culture agree with you in the news, all, a lot of the news in the, you know, from over here and, you know, in the States, you know, CNN and MSN, you know, all, and over, you know, the BBC, you know, can have all those people agree with you and you're still the counterculture. It doesn't work that way. That's not how, that's not how things work. You can't be the, the mainstream culture and the counterculture at the same time. So this, I, you know, this idea that, you know, uh, you know, um, Johnny Rotten's a great example. I mean, he's still pissing people off. You know, <laughs> he's still he's still pissing people off, uh, and you know, um, it's like that. It's like that in NPC meme. You know, the NPC meme, and there and it's like saying I'm punk. It's like no, you're not. You know, and I'm not saying I am either, yeah. but you're definitely not. You know. A counterculture figure if you're disagreeing with every single thing you know that's that's your that you know you're regurgitating everything from that that uh mainstream news is saying mtv is saying they're all saying you know yeah you're not I and mean, that's just that's just how it is there's the mainstream and then there's the counterculture hmm. you know, so i wonder your take on this i i was I overheard a conversation, it would be a few months back now, of people who had been cancelled in the music industry. And um, one of the examples, they, well, the most famous band from where I'm from, um, they went to my school, they were called the Lost Prophets, and they, they, they were really big at one point. They were worldwide, they were headlining festivals. And the lead singer of that band did some unspeakable things, and he's in prison now. But he was mentioned in the same conversation as another example who just, had a tweet discovered from like 10 years ago and was canceled for that. And I just think those are not two of the same thing. They're completely different, but we treat them as if they're the same now. I think like for musicians now, you've got to be pretty much squeaky clean from the day you were born or you don't have a chance to make it, it feels like. Yeah. It's, it's the Inquisition. Hmm. Um, one sin, you know, from, from, you know, back in the day, you know, people will find it. Um, it can't go on like this. It can't go on like this. Uh, someone's going to have made, you know, talk to the wrong person or said something that, you know, isn't politically correct now. Um, you know, this is, you know, it can't go on like this. So, mm. I don't know. I guess it just has to, it has to just, you know, every, people just have to keep getting canceled. Um, whatever the hell that means. I don't know. But, you know, these, these people that are behind it are, you know, you know, they, you know, just like, just like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Stalin had more contempt for, you know, the liberals than he did, you know, any of any, uh, you know, anyone who is, uh, I guess, more so, you know, um, traditional hmm. in, in Russia. He had more contempt for them. It's, bi it's biblical, really. It's, you know, you are neither hot nor cold, so you are lukewarm. So it you know, spewing you out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so these people that are, that are, you know, not that I'm like, Try really fighting anything but it but you know I, i'm talking about it and i'm talking about how insane it is to try to cancel you know try to cancel anything that you know anything that anything anyone finds you know like you just said a tweet from 10 years ago or whatever you know that's it's just it's just insane you know and it leads to destruction and ruining people's lives uh and you know, it's not going to be good. It's we're we're in a we're in a we're in a tough uh, situation. I think yeah. all over the world, all over the world. I think it's I think um, I think it's really I think you know I don't know I don't know what's going to happen, but it feels it doesn't feel good. It feels no. like it feels feels bad. Well, I've always thought, yeah, we you know we've all said things when we were younger, or there's always going to be something in someone's past if you look hard enough to find something yeah. to cancel them over. <laughs> Um, Especially young kids oh, who who've spent their who've spent their lives, you know, gaming on video, you know, you know, 
yeah talking trash saying god knows what to their yeah. friends you're always going to find something of and, course of course and i've always thought if they say there's a, a huge pop star and we discover something they said 10 years ago they're a horrible person but surely we should celebrate how they've changed and you know how they've moved past that rather than just saying nope you're the same as you were 10 years ago there's no going back we've cancelled you surely would do better good to say yeah they said that you know this this horrible thing once but they've changed as a person they grow they you know they have a different view of that now you can too surely that's a good thing to celebrate no you think you know it's one of the one of the one of the good one of the uh really important things about uh the in my opinion the you know judeo-christian west is this idea of forgiveness mm. you know and as as uh you know secular modernity keeps uh coming in you know they don't you know forgiveness is not on the menu not not you know you know for some people for some people that really toe the line and stay you know then then you know they're kind of let off the hook but uh yeah, forgiveness is. We I don't think we really understand how 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 uh, create you know how important of a concept that is, you know. So, because obviously there are new sins, there are new there there are, you know new new deadly sins, you know. As we start to wind down now, I'll move into the, the final two questions we ask every guest regardless yeah. of the topic. The first one, what, I don't know if you're much of a reader, but what books have you read yeah. in your life that have had a big impact on who you are today? I mean, my, my, one, of my, the, one of the first books I ever read, you know, that I, when I was a kid, I loved The Hobbit. Uh, uh, Tolkien, for me, was uh, very influential. I've always loved fantasy. Uh, you know, especially reading, you know, people like, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell, you know, the idea of the hero's journey. I think, I think Tolkien has, you know, those books are, you know, deeper than just the story, especially, you know, like Lord of the Rings or whatever. Um, uh, and I would also say... Uh, you know, Andrew Breitbart's Righteous Indignation is a really, really good book. I know a lot of people don't like him. They, you know, he's a problem with him, but um, great book. Um, and then I've been, uh, I've been reading a little bit of uh, Tom Holland's Dominion, his new book. Uh, that's been really good, really good. Um and then another like life changing book. I reread Animal Farm the other day. Definitely encourage. You know that's a great one. Sure. That's a great one. You know, a lot can be learned from history, but I think stories are really important. And uh, we obviously know this. That in Hollywood knows this. Um, you know that that stories are really really important. You know more so than just telling people, oh, you know, be a good person or whatever. It's like. You know, you can tell kids that all day, but instead, it, you know, it's better like, oh, here's a movie of, you know, look at Spider-Man. You know, they'll, they'll get that. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about this all the time, you know, like you kind of, uh, yeah, you can tell someone to just be good or you could, you know, but people, you know, especially young kids, they, they see those heroic virtues, you know, out of Batman or, you know, these, you know, characters and they, and they try to, uh, you know, emulate that. You know, so stories are very, very important. That's why I like Animal Farm. It's interesting you mentioned um, Tolkien. I always keep, well, I've got my Tolkien book Love box that. set right here on my desk. Um, but yeah, I mean, stories like that, that are so creative fancy. I'm assuming they're quite influential on people like yourself, creative people who, you know, without even realizing it, probably opens your mind up to all these you know, creative perspectives gets the juices flowing. And it's no surprise that someone like yourself, a musician, loves fantasy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was even, I, you know, uh, um, I think Jonathan Paggio uh, 
he said um, he said something like, you know, anyone who wants to write fantasy, you know, you ought, you automatically are in Tolkien's world. Tolkien created the world for fantasy. I mean, if you if you tried to get rid of Tolkien, I mean, you'd spend like ten years of your life as a fantasy writer trying to write the Tolkien out of you. Yeah. To, you know, he just he Tolkien uh, he knew what he was doing. For sure. Um, and those. Uh, and I heard Tom Holland say this the other uh, in one of his podcasts the other day. Lord of the Rings is probably um, one of probably the mm, one of the most important books of the 20th century, probably. You know, even though it's a story, right? Yeah. But it, but you know, so you know, and again, like 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 Peterson talks, you know, um, has said many times, uh, you know, even, there's it's truer than true. Right. There's 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 deeper truth in in some of in especially something like Lord of the Rings than just giving a historical account yeah. of, uh, you know, of, you know, history. Um, the powerful, powerful stuff. And that's why that's why it, it's done so well, obviously. Yeah, there, I think anyone who's read um, any of Jordan Peterson's book, I mean, I think in his new one, he references Harry Potter. I think in the first one, he talks yeah. Lord of the Rings. You're absolutely right there, man. It's uh, it's amazing. Oh, there, there's a good one. There's a there's a really good one. Look at the canceling around J.K. Rowling. I mean, totally I insane, insane. They're trying to rename Quidditch. What the what the hell is you know? Sorry, but uh, it's just insanity. I know. Insane. I saw a. Um... They're gonna. They'll try to get rid of. Harry Potter world over here at Universal Universal Studios here in Hollywood. I'm sure I can't. Yeah. You can't. You know, if if you know anything that this sinner has created must now be destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they've they've gone pretty deep on finding it. I was I saw a thread on Twitter the other week, and it was that one character's name. If you sort of twist there enough, it looks like a slur, and then. If you look at this character, then it represents this ethnicity and it's telling you that this ethnicity is better. And it's like, you're just clutching at straws now. 100%. There will be nothing left. Hmm. You know, um, you know, and they're, uh, you know, they'll just keep going. I mean, if they're going to have to re rename Quidditch, then they're going to have to, you know, figure out a way to write, you know, any anything she's done now is tainted and toxic yeah so what are they gonna do you know um i don't know it's insane the crazy and it's gonna world. it's gonna get worse <laughs> it's gonna get it's gonna get worse i know i know well i'm sure we'll be here to uh discuss the madness all the way through but uh moving on to the final question so yep. this could be anything. It could be your music. It could be your family. It could be your friends. But right now, for Mason Musso, what makes life worth living? What makes life worth living? Um, yeah, family. Uh, and yeah, music is very important. For me, music is therapy. So being able to, you know, whatever I'm feeling, get out those emotions and... Uh, is super important for me you know it's like a pressure valve you know getting able to you know being able to like you know you know i'm sure that's i'm sure that's the same way for for any creative person for an, a painter an artist you know whatever you know you release some of that pressure that's building up in you um and you get it down on paper or you get it down on a guitar you you know you record it you know um uh, very important to do and uh yeah it's therapy it's great and um, that's that family. Um, yeah, probably the most important things um, in my life. Absolutely. So where can our audience connect with you, find out more about your music projects? I know you, you recently put in some, some brand new music out. Where can they check all that out? Uh, def on my Instagram, the Mason Musso. Um, that's uh, I'm more uh, active on Instagram and on Twitter, uh, mm -hmm. the Mason Musso, um, but more so on Instagram, I'd say. Uh, and I'm now on Getter. I saw that you're on Getter yeah, as well, I over. right? Yeah, nice. Uh, so yeah, those three I would say are super important. 
um, and where you can uh, find out everything I'm doing. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on. Thank no, it's we, an we absolute do it again. pleasure. Definitely, man. We we'll definitely have to have you back. It's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel there's more and more and more we could talk about, especially as uh, this world gets even crazier. So I'm sure we'll do this Absolutely. again. Absolutely. Absolutely.